This is Jazz Lockdown, a jazz quiz devised and presented by Clark Tracy with our regular panel of Pete Long, Alex Garnett and Alan Barnes. Please donate to Macmillan Cancer Support via the link below and don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell for future notifications. In this episode our special guest is John Etheridge and Alan Shepton is in the chair. Well, welcome to the latest episode of Jazz Lockdown. I'm delighted that this time we have a very special guest, a man of many talents, but in particular, a very good raconteur and participant in quizzes, John Etheridge. Welcome, right. John. Good morning. And we also have our regular group of contestants. We have Alan Barnes. Hello, folks. We have Alex Garnett. Good evening. And we have Pete Long. Hola. Now... What we normally do, John, just to get you into the mood of things, is we have an introductory round where questions might be hard, they might be easy, but it's just one for everybody and a few bonuses just to see how it goes. So, Pete, we're going to start with you. All right. And um, who was mopping and bopping on trumpet with Fats Waller in 1943? Mopping and bopping with uh, Fats Waller. In 1943... I can only guess that he got young John Gillespie in for a session. No, it's a favourite of yours, actually. Anybody else know? Oh, Benny Carter. Benny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's Benny. one each for that. God, he gets around, doesn't he? Oh. So, um, Alex, whose wagon wheels weren't chocolate and marshmallow biscuits? Sure, <laughs> there are. On this, you've got to be quick and <laughs> be wagon wheels have got much smaller now. Have you noticed? Oh, no, God. wagons have just got bigger, mate. It's aging. Wagon wheels, is it? Uh, I, I, I'm so far out today, but is it? It's not a Sonny Rollins, is it? It is. You've got it right. Well done. Oh, wow. That's why I mentioned be quick and be swift. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tour de force. Right. Um, Anybody know, by the way, talking of confectionery, which city, the, this is a bonus for anyone, which city the trio Jaffa Cakes is based in? Lisbon. Nope. Which city? Yeah. Bath. Nope. This can go on for a while, couldn't it? Is, is, it, on the main, is, it, on the, is it on the British mainland? <laughs> no. Oh, good. So it, it must be... Uh, oh, I know, Seville. No, I'm going to put you out of your misery. It's Dublin. And oh, they're okay. good old Irish names. There's uh, Paolo Zudas on the drums, Dario Rodriguero on the piano, and Pliny Felix on vocals. So there you go. <laughs> wow. They're not bad. So like, yeah, so, um, you've got to get Pliny Felix on. Pliny. Can, we get, can we get him as a guest? So, um, Alan, Alan, it's your turn now. Oh. Who was the pianist on the Chocolate Dandies recording of Smack? And I surrender, dear, with Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge. Oh my God! Um, smack. Now I've oh. got the re I've let got the records and I've heard them several times. It's not Johnny Guaneri, is it? No. Not Art Tatum. No. Right. Um, is <laughs> is one of the titles a clue to the it's identity? Benny of Carter, is it? <laughs> it is Benny Carter. What's well yeah. <laughs> Oh, for crying out loud! It's the Benny Carter Show. Right. And uh, a bone. Felix. Uh, thinking of uh, versatile people, which two singers and entertainers starred in Hot Chocolates at New York's Hudson Theatre in 1929, one after the other? Josephine Baker. Wrong sex, but. <coughs> oh, um, Kenny Baker. <laughs> <laughs> um... uh, the, the feature song was Ain't Misbehaving. Oh, Fats Waller. Yep. Followed by... Well, wrote it, but he's not one of the two stars. Okay. Um, 1928. It's a male. Yeah, it's uh, two males, one after the other. One who, who starred in the role and then went on to something else, and one who came in after it and became a star. Oh, I'm not very good at this. Uh, Bojangles. It was around, but no, it was... Um, Bowley, was it? No, it was Louis, oh. Armstrong, Louis Armstrong first and Cab Calloway second. Ah. But it was well, the, out of them? It silly, was the silly theme question. that was keeping us going. You see, hot chocolates. Oh, nice. well, anyway. Ah, uh, splendid. Theme, theme ground. 
So, John, which item of confectionery did Django record twice? Once as a duo with Stefan, and then as a quartet with André Etkin, Barrow Ferré, and Emmanuel Studio in 1940. Oh, my God. Uh, nougat. No, no. Mont uh, <laughs> Rhymes with nougat. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, bloody hell. You see, I used to know these things. It's all gone. The brain's died. Nougat, um, uh, oh, oh, God. You'd have to be very posh to say it like that. It's the way that somebody like Peter Boise would say this word, rhyming with nougat. <sighs> oh, God, I give up. No, what? Go Anybody on. know? Not you are. Yeah. No, it's sugar. Oh, sugar. 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 Nuage. Right. Nougage. Nougage. Yeah. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll do the old and new round now. So, Pete, yeah. we start oh, with you. Um, out in the last few days, whose new project is the ever funky lowdown? I'll give well, you a clue. I've been <laughs> asleep since February. <laughs> what? I've been asleep since February. Go on, ask me questions like that. <laughs> Let me just tell you what he says in his press release about it. The new world is something we must fight for, and the first step of doing is seeing. Awareness and acuity are the keys to escaping the complex web of very willful obfuscations on all sides of the equation. This is a responsibility and a burden we all share. In times of such cloudiness, to act is itself heroic. And there's only one musician I could think of who'd go on like that. Wow, that's pretty good. I like that's that. To act, it's I think a British musician. No. An American one. One, one of your old favourites, Pete. Winton. It's got to be Winton. It's, yeah. Winton. it's got to be Winton. Isn't it? Good old Winton. The yeah. beat folk answer. Good for him. Is and it a Bobby Bolden tribute? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit more recent than that. but. I mean, I ploughed my way through understanding Tony Blair, but that lot was beyond me, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can get a simple confectionery question then, Pete. So... Who recorded Pound Cake in 1939? Cam Basie. Yep. Wow. Who was the soloist, as a matter of interest? Mr. Young. Yep. Bonus wow. point. Well done. Very good. Points. John. Points mean prizes. They, no, they don't, actually. They're just, <laughs> that, it's just an abstract construct. So let's see, see how you do with this one, John. So who said, don't let the dragon eat your mother, brother? Who said, don't let the dragon eat your brother, mother? Mother, brother. <laughs> don't let the dragon eat your mother, brother. It was something in the 30s, wasn't it? No, it's two <laughs> tracks from the 70s. Oh, my God, is it? Yeah. I wouldn't want you to extrapolate anything from it, but... Um... Herbie Hancock? No. No, there's a clue in what I just said. Oh, is this a guitar player? Is it yes. Guitar? Oh, bloody hell. Uh, okay, from the 70s. Oh, God. Uh, not John McLaughlin, that's not a title. This is John McLaughlin, you're John right. John McLaughlin, right. <laughs> no, I get a point. I said, you get the it's point. John McLaughlin. I didn't say it's not John McLaughlin, I said it's John McLaughlin. Now, which band leader was the slime and nodded at King Kong on his way to being the Grand, Grand Wizard? Bapper. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank God for that. So, Alex, whose album was a double Grammy winner with stories from the river west of Manhattan? Oh, that was Michael Brecker. And yeah. like, Tales from the Hudson. Yeah. Well done. Hudson, yeah, yeah. And which bridge was the one where Sonny Rollins took time off to practice for a oh, couple of years? Williamsburg. Yep. Yeah. Well done. Oh, yeah. Alan, yeah. trumpeter has recently eclipsed all his old trumpets. Oh, that's uh, my old pal Bruce Adams. Who's <laughs> just pal. become sponsored or something by Eclipse. Yes, he's got a deal with them. And I'm constantly called upon to uh, tell him they sound good. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> that's fantastic. As, as you've just done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where did you have the motorway blues and um, uh, chuck out a lot of vinyl? Oh, um, that was a set of songs called um, Unsung, Songs for Unsung Heroes with Alan Plater, commonly yep. known in the band as Songs for Well-Hung Heroes. 
And I believe Mr. I had, Adams. I had to leave the band. I believe Mr. <laughs> Adams was also on that one. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, now we come to the round, John, where you are not up against the other members of the team, but you're up against our previous guests in this little mini series of six. Ooh, ooh, okay. So um, you're going to have to try and beat nine points out of ten. So let's see how you do. So let's start with this one. Which item of your clothing was Stefan Grappelli appalled at on your first gig with him? Oh, my shoes. Yeah. Well, shoes, you are not on a farm. Clean them. <laughs> <laughs> you are not on a farm. <laughs> Brilliant. Who helped you out with Sweet Chorus along with Le Jazz et al? Dave Kelby. Yep. All done. Um, which beatnik gave you a platform to fight the Battle of Jericho? Which beatnik gave me a platform to fight the Battle of Jericho? Which beatnik gave me a platform to fight? Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. Yep. It might have been a duo performance. Uh, oh, that was in the at the Oxford at the bookshop in Oxford. Which is called. I can't remember what it's called. Oh. I can't what it's called because I just go there and uh, it's the beat, Beatnik Bookshop or something like that. Exactly, the Albion Beatnik. Albion. Yes. <laughs> and, like, Grant, Green's, Grant Green's daughter was in the audience. Wow. Oh. So I, we did a very um, po po poor version of, I must say it wasn't that good, but we did it. We did Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, me and Pete Oxley. Yeah. And I was, was there. Was, and we went to you, the I know you were there. That's why you know. Otherwise, this would be a, the most obscure question that only some sort of extraordinary lurker would know about. Yeah. Well, there. here's the lurker question. Then. nasturtiums about our quiz master. <laughs> I, 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 this is a lurker question. With which violinist did you have a spot of second vision? Oh, Rick Sanders. Yep. And with which violinist did you explore the music of a left-handed guitarist who died 50 years ago this September? Left-handed guitarist who died 50 years ago. So you're celebrating that person's music with a violinist. God, blimey, blimey. Left-handed guitarist. Yeah, 17th of September, 1970. He died. Yeah. He died on the 17th of September. In Brook Street. And he was left-handed. Bloody hell. Hang on, hang on. Oh, with which violinist? God. The violinist was right-handed. Yes, the violinist was right-handed. Could it be Chris Garrick? No. Went to the Hoody menu in school. No, Nigel Kennedy. Yeah, Nigel Kennedy. Well done. Hendrix, wasn't it? John Hendrix. Who's the guitarist are we talking about? Hendrix. Hendrix, yeah. You oh, said, Hendrix. Jimmy. Jimmy, not John. Oh, God. It, that's, a, that's ridiculous. Anyway, I'm giving it to you because you've got Kennedy. So. Jazz guitarist. I mean, there's no left-handed jazz guitarist, I think, apart from Chris Allard. Come on then. Lee Blair. Anyway. Who? Who? Lee Blair was the rhythm guitarist in the Lewis Russell Orchestra. He was left handed. Well, Benny Carter. Oh, Benny Carter was left handed. He was a right, left handed. Let's, let's keep on with John's, John's yeah. round here because he got five out of five so far, just. Yeah. Um, which which ex policeman couldn't see your suit? Well, the ex policeman would be Andy Summers. Right? Yeah. He couldn't see my suit. Yeah, well, think of how people refer to suits in certain parts of the world. How people refer to suits in certain parts of the world. Especially uh, if you can't see them. Whistle. Uh, whistle and flute. No. Uh, you can't see them. Uh, in, invisible, uh, invisible threads. Invisible threads, exactly. Invisible threads. Very good. Very good, Alan. That's a good clue. Which colour was the spirit of your organ trio? Blue. <laughs> Which guitarist bundled you off to a soft machine? Oh, Alan Holdsworth. Yep. Which bassist from Bermondsey <clears throat> went a bit mental in 1990? Which bassist? Oh, Danny Thompson. Yep. And finally, always... which establishment nearly had you chained to a copper beech tree? Ah, well, English Heritage Kenwood Estate, the Hammond High, the Hammond High Journal. 
I offered to chain myself to the beech tree. Right. They're looking blank. <laughs> they were going to cut down were you in your birthday suit? Trees. They were cutting down trees in the English heritage set, these beautiful copper beeches. So I said, if I'll chain myself to those bloody <clears> copper beeches. So they took me up on it. And so I was chained to the copper beeches, flogged to within an inch of my life. Ooh. Don't but me. they saved the tree. Like Ooh, come on. Come on. <laughs> well, what I can tell you, John, is that chaining yourself to the beaches or not, you have 10 out of 10, which puts you um, oh, somewhat God. at the top of this little league. Well done. Immortal. Right. What do points mean? Oh, yeah. Bugger all. <laughs> <laughs> what do points mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not much in the way of prizes. Um, OK, we're now doing another um, catchphrase type quiz. So this is just a lockdown where you have to speak for one minute without hesitation, deviation, repetition. And I thought, Pete, we might start with you. Um, so could you talk about dealing with a squeaky chair? So dealing with a squeaky chair starting now. I often find... If I, uh... <laughs> what? Hesitation. Oh, he's playing the latency wild card, but I'm so happy to <laughs> with the bloody latency wild card. It's all is. This is a friendly quiz. <laughs> I, on this occasion, <laughs> I, on this occasion, I'm going to pass it to John. Yeah, but, no. oh, but really? the sharp intake of breath oh, is normally oh, allowed. I've got to apologise to Pete before we start. Okay, I'm sorry, Pete. I was right. Uh, a bit... All right, I'm glad all you've right. got it. So what's the so question? John, if you'd like to talk about dealing with a squeaky chair, starting now. Well, I find the problem with a squeaky chair is that you move it in one direction and it makes a howling noise. You change your direction. Oh, I'm doing the repetition of direction. Yeah, I think Alex dinged just before the squeak there. <laughs> so, Alex, if you'd like to talk about dealing with a squeaky chair, something I'm sure you're an expert in, starting now. Dealing with a squeaky chair is of utmost importance, especially at a recording session. I have found on many occasions that the, cha uh, the chair that I have been allocated happens to be one that is not put together very well. And all the metal parts create that extremely awful noise, especially when you're moving forward to read. Alan? Was it the two especially? Fun enough, there was. Ah. Oh, very, cool. very well spotted, Alan. So you get the point and you move forward starting now. The way to deal with a squeaky chair, especially on a recording session, is to push down with your buttocks firmly into the centre of the chair, bracing your knees and spraying your feet in a 10 to 2 position. <laughs> Not, you can't have two, Pete. He meant splaying, didn't he? Not spraying. If you're spraying yeah. your feet in the tentative yeah. position. I was using my sills foot powder. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> That's your story. Uh, uh, I'm like you're no athlete then. But um, <laughs> uh, I would say actually that, um, that, that splaying and spraying, that's a deviation. So Pete, oh. you can carry on with this one. So um, dealing with a squeaky chair, starting now. My very esteemed colleague, Anthony Kerr, the noted vibraphone player, has a particular aversion to squeaky chairs in the context of the jazz club hearing. Was that particularly aversion? Adver well, yes, it was, you got me. Right, Alan, you have okay. one second starting now. <laughs> Push downwards. They are repetition. Right. <laughs> repetition. <laughs> too late. It's too late. <laughs> right. John, I wonder if you would like to talk for us uh, for a minute on the subject of ghost bands. So ghost if you could talk for a minute. Ghost bands. Well, ghost bands. OK. Ready? Starting now. This is a concept with which I'm not particularly familiar, but the idea of the ghost band is quite appealing. We could get gentlemen who long departed this mortal coil, put them together and put a, uh, get a, uh, a, a band. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, think, I think that was pretty much Alan and Alex, but Alan, we'll go, go with you this time. A repetition of air, for a long word. What's that? Uh, uh. All right. Yeah. That, that word, yes. Uh, otherwise known as hesitation. But yes, off we go. Alan, starting. Starting now. The great tenorist and flute player, Frank Wes, had an answering machine message which went like this. 
Uh, if you want me for a session, it's double rate. If um, <laughs> eventually, I'm sure you can tell us where we're going with this. But oh, it, um, the final bit is if it's a ghost band, hang up now. Right. <laughs> Except I did see him with Winton doing a ghost band thing at one point. Anyway, never mind. Yeah. Um, uh, pretty much a tie between Alex and Pete there for the thing, but let's uh, move to Pete for this one. So, Pete, would you like to pick up, please, starting now? Unfortunately, the expression ghost band is a new one on me, so I haven't got a clue how to talk about it. I'm assuming it might refer to something like the Fantasy Football League, where one could construct an imaginary band out of the deceased greats of the past. In my particular ghost band, I would without a doubt have Duke Ellington on piano, as in my view, he was the consummate accompanist. I would enjoy the services of Charlie Parker on the alto saxophone. And of course, no band would be complete without Benny Carter and any deceased members. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to the minute. Well done. So what is a ghost band? Is that yeah, what is ghost band? Well, well, it's, like, it's like the Glenn Miller Orchestra still touring. Um, but oh, right. oh, ghost band. Oh, right. Like uh, Mercer Ellington or something. You're right. Okay. Warren Vasher used to say, dead men fill halls. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we, we've yeah. done pretty well out of Mr. Clayton, I'd have to say. Anyway. Right. Alex, um, this is a topic I'm sure dear to all our hearts. Could you talk about the singer who asks to sit in? So starting now, the singer who starts to sit in. After having suffered a reasonably long tenure running the Late Show at Ronnie Scott's, where singers are almost banned unless they are somebody who is a celebrity. Unfortunately, I have had to endure the sitting in moments where the person uh, approaching the microphone. <laughs> <has come up. laughs> yes. Um, He's oh. gibbering. <laughs> yes, and he is also hesitating. <laughs> so, I nearly had it. The, the, the large wheel was just starting to roll. It was it was doing all right. Coming downhill right, is a wagon wheel, obviously. So um, <laughs> if you'd like to carry on, please, the singer who asked to sit in. I now. was playing at the Bull's Head one afternoon with the Total Big Trio. Name dropping. <laughs> dropping. <laughs> Incorrect challenge. Alan keeps it's the, the ghost band. <laughs> Alan, carry a on. A singer approached and asked to sit in, sit, playing, uh, having a... <laughs> That was a dingle from Alex, I think. So, Alex, you carried There's a fumble there and a hesitation, probably um, because of I my think, earlier... I think you can see the fumble, but I know about the hesitation. <laughs> That's your bacon oh. fat again. Oh, it's <laughs> about to carry on, please. Uh, pick up the singer you asked to sit in now. As I was mentioning before, the aforementioned singer would approach the microphone... Oh, sorry. Incorrect challenge. I thought you were going to say that the aforementioned was necess of necessity repetition, but uh, as it oh, was, no. it, it crossed no. my, Alan, my mind, Alan, and I thought it was too petty. So, Alex keeps the point, so on we go. Alex. Approaches and asks to play something along, along the lines of... Well, I, thought, I thought he hesitated a bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's back. He on for the repetition <laughs> of approaches, but um, <laughs> what do you think? But um, I don't think that was repetition. So actually, Alex, I'm going to keep you with the point. So carry on, please, Alex. Sorry. Having to withstand a horrible list of tunes. <laughs> that was please. definitely hesitation. Having to withstand. Oh, yeah. it's like Pete, that. You pick this one up. Yeah, so, no, more, no thing. more, Mr. Gu nice guy, big nose. <laughs> <laughs> so the singer who asked to sit, to sit in Pete starting now I blame the demise of the great George Gershwin standard summertime entirely deviation As, how, how so, you know? how so? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Pete keeps the point because we don't know if it's deviation or not yet yeah. finish the sentence Pete um, picking up with the word you, summertime starting now you. Entirely on singers at private functions who want to sit in. Drunken women approach. Yes. Was it two entirely. It was two entirely. Oh, was, I thought I had said entirely. Right, Alan. Starting now. I've actually forgotten what the <laughs> subject is. <laughs> hesitation. What is uh, the subject? Alex, you pick that one up for hesitation, please. Alex, you have one second. Starting now. 
Uh, and other uh, horrible tunes such as Blue Moon, some hesitation. You just got the minute there. <laughs> right. Oh, the latency wild card. Blue, <coughs> Blue Moon, the lady is a tramp with no bridge. <laughs> at the, the end of the Tony Lee story, the singer said, I want to sing whatever it was, you know, um, Ladies a Tramp. And he said, what key? And she said, medium. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just have to um, relay one quick anecdote about the trio that Ian Smith and I had at the Coach and Horses in Clerkenwell. And this bloke comes and oh. says, uh, 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 could, I, could I possibly sing a number after the interval? And Ian goes, well, we don't normally have singers uh, sitting in, but OK, you can just do one. What do you want to sing? And he said, oh, um, I'll just sing all of me if that's all right. So he sang, it's absolutely brilliant. And Ian said at the end, he said, look, he said, that was great. Can you come next week? He said, no, actually, I'll be singing the, load, uh, the lead in Buddy in, in the West End next week. But I just thought I'd give it a bit of practice down here. <laughs> Is that yeah. Buddy Golden? <laughs> Almost as old, but bigger spectacles. I, I had a funny one. I had a big band on, a very knobby do. And this posh woman oh. came up and wanted to sing all of me. I can't remember what it was. And I said, oh, do you know what key you want to sing it in? And she went, you're the pro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> at, which, at which point we have to ask Alan to do his Just a Lockdown. Oh, oh, so um, now I think we have had a slightly similar uh, subject to this, but the subject is what not to eat in the interval. So if you could talk about what not to eat in the interval, just get my split watch to turn itself back on again. Hang on. Starting now. Anybody who's seen the movie Cool Hand Luke will know that one of the foods to avoid in the interval of a gig is a pickled egg. However many of them you eat, it be it just one, maybe 17 of them. It's always a mistake, folks, including, of course, onions of the same type and those little bits of cauliflower you get floating round in the vinegar with the, with the peppercorns. You know what I'm talking about. Best soaked up with a bit of white bread uh, or even br brown um, bakery stuff. <laughs> no, no, don't. That was good. I was enjoying that. I know. <laughs> we, we, had, we had an arthritisism. We had a burr brown. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, we also had three bit offs, which nobody seemed to notice. But, um, I didn't care. I was enjoying that. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I thought it was great. But Pete, you get the point for that. So if you'd like to carry on, please, starting about uh, what not to eat in the interval starting now. This very much depends on what you've had to eat before the gig, because have you gone in such a way that you've not been able to have a dinner before <laughs> playing? Before. Yeah. Two, two halves. Yes. Two befores. Yeah. Oh, I was getting my timeline very clear. So, Alan, um, back to you, please. Uh, you may have um, uh, exhausted the pickled egg and onion option, but anyway, let's see where we go from here. Alan, you starting now. Salt and vinegar crisps are another thing to be avoided. I've often accidentally pebble dashed the glasses of jazz fans seated at the front. I've even suggested windscreen wipers that could be bought and stuck onto these glasses. Oh. <laughs> Oh. <coughs> what was that? Glasses, was it? We had, we had a pair of a pair of spectacles, yeah. yeah. A, a, a pair of braces. Yes. Uh, it was a, a nanosecond between the toot and the tinkle, but anyway, Pete, you get it. So if you'd just like to talk about it for one second, starting now, please. Oh, rice. Don't eat rice. There you go. <laughs> Two easy points there. Right. It's now we come to the round called Spot the Intro. Oh. Oh, God. So, Alex, I'm hoping that the volume control is going to work and you can hear this. See how you do with the first 14 seconds of this. And think about it, could be the artist, could be the song. Just see if you can spot this intro. <laughs> That's a, is that Stan Tracy? Nope. Mm. Mm. It's not even somebody he passed the baton to. Oh, wow. Oh, baton. Oh, is it uh, not Dr. John, is it? Nope. No, I have no idea. Is it, is it Andre Previn? It is Andre Previn. Wow. wow. 
Well, well done. And you'll ah. get the tune now. Oh, you would have got the tune, but I've just cancelled it. It's, um, it's <laughs> I could have danced all night from oh, wow. my radio <laughs> album with Shelley Mann. <laughs> right. Um, I could have danced all night. <laughs> see if you can get this from the first 15 seconds. Absolutely right. Well, if people will ring into radio programmes and mention that you've got the wrong date, I thought you should have, uh, get yeah. my own back with that one. <laughs> I didn't hear who it was. Who was it? John Lachlan. Oh. Yeah, on acoustic on guitar. 19, 1971, I'm afraid. Ah. Not 1970, yes. certain people. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reissue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pete, you're going to get a very short bit of a very famous British record by a British band leader who is not to be heard in this little excerpt. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, John Altman, oh. no? Yeah, I know. John, then John would write all about it on Facebook, how he bought in <laughs> two. Yeah, no. So, that uh, was a massive clue. John, John Altman wouldn't... Um... And it's not the wolf. I don't know. Uh, is the artist Sid Phillips or something? Phillips, yes, he yeah. is. Absolutely. Yeah. It's covered, Sid Phillips covered whole it. clarinet, Pete. Oh, what? A covered whole clarinet he played. Oh, yes. Yes. John's and, uh, taking it, interest at this point. And it goes on like this. <laughs> Massive hit for Sid Phillips called the old piano roll blues. Right. Anyway, you got it. So that's good. Um, Alan, we've got a very long introduction for you. Oh. So let's just see if... Um, in the 43 seconds of introduction, oh. you can work out what this is. seconds left. <laughs> is it Ellingtonian? No. Oh. Um, is it Roy Eldridge? Uh, no, it isn't actually, though it could have been. Ah. So somebody it, from that... He is the other African-American trumpeter player who sat in with Artie Shaw, all this is not an Artie Shaw record. Cootie? No. No. Um, oh, I know. Um, Lips Page. It was Lips Page. Well done. Bonus well. point if you could get the drummer. Um, Nick Fatool. Nick Fatool. Sadly, no. It was, um, especially <laughs> given the sartorial uh, accoutrements, <laughs> of uh, it's Spex Powell. Oh, right. But right. the band is quite <laughs> It's Bud Freeman's Summer Come Loudy Orchestra. Oh, there we go. And, and it goes, the piece goes like this. Sheik of Araby. I want that record. Yeah. Yeah. Phone is for you, Alex, there for Sheik of Araby. Well done. <laughs> um, so there we go. One of the more unusual uh, openings of a piece. I thought we all my introductions have been so short. I thought I'd go for one a bit longer this That's time. Amazing. Thank That's you. Amazing. Right. It's the quick fire round. So oh. basically, it's jump in if you can, and I'll try and notice. But some of the questions <laughs> are slightly long, so I might not. Jump so in if you can. I'll try and notice. <laughs> and when you finish, I jump. Put the back down. I'm trying to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. Right. So, the 1984 supergroup Out of the Blue featured which young trumpeter who'd Winter. worked with Anthony... Winter Marsalis? Nope. Wallace worked with Anthony Blackstone. What? Wallace Roney. 
No, Anthony Braxton, Lionel Hampton and Dizzy Gillespie. Claudio Roditi. No. I may have to give you this one. It's Philip Anthony Mossman. Oh. The late Dave Mossman's venue, the Vortex, was originally in Stoke Newington. What was sold downstairs? Books. Oh, books. Yep. Uh, yeah. Alex, you got the point there. Um, talking about books, who released the songbook, blues book and space book in the mid-60s? Irving. Yeah, well done. In which decade did Irving Berlin compose All By Myself? The 20s. Alan just picked that 20s. Um, Jamie Cullum's album, 20-something, prompted Stan Tracy to release which album? 70-something. Oh, equal for Alan and Pete there. Well done. Something to Live For was... Sorry, guys. Something to Live For was the first collaboration between whom? Billy Strayhorn and Duke Ellington. Correct. What was the name of Ellington's tribute album to Strayhorn following his death? His mother called him Bill. Bill. Yeah. Point each for Alan and Pete there, who um, talked over each other. Um, who, was, who was the last drummer in the Bill Evans trio? Oh. Oh, I Came to London with Mark Johnson. Yeah, yeah no. Um, what was his name? That's like a resort. Larry Gale. Oh, no, hang on. Uh, Larry name, name like a resort, did you say? Yeah. Wasn't Eric Morcom, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was Joe La Barbera. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, his brother Pat played in which drummer's band in the seventies? Oh, I said oh that. Point, point for John there. Um, their last album together was recorded live at the Pit Inn. Where is the Pit Inn? San Francisco. Nope. Rochester. Nope. Philadelphia. I don't think we're going to get this one. It's Tokyo. Oh, I was smoking at the pit, of course. Voted, voted Japan's best jazz guitarist 32 years in a row, who recently celebrated his 40th year in jazz. Oh, it's... Uh, 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 oh, yeah. It's the guy Watanabe. on that. Watanabe. Watanabe, Watanabe, yeah. Yeah, John just pipped it. Well mm. done. So um, you and Me was recorded in 1960 by which two tenor players? Zoot and Al. Al. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, Al just, Al just got that one. Um, which Mississippi-born pianist's on that album? Mose Allison. Yep. And which London club did Mose often appear and also made a record? Express. 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 Well, I think that's one for everybody there. Um, Prior to presenting Cabaret, which promoter elevated that club after a substantial facelift and expansion in the 80s? Peter Wallace. I know, Wallace. Peter Wallace. Yeah, Alan got there first with Peter right. Wallace. Um, for a short time, Wallace also had his eye on another club nearby that he wanted Joss. to offer. Joss. Yeah, Joss. well done, John. He didn't get there in the end, but that's what he wanted. Which pianist during that period in the 80s had a residency in the nearby restaurant Les Cargo? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his name? Wasn't it wasn't Brian Bode, was it? Oh, no, no, no. It's, um... it wasn't Brian Lemon, was it? Was it Brian? Uh, was it Brian? Uh, Brian who lives not, in a, not, not a Brian at all, but used to share a flat with Tony Coe. Yeah. Purbrook. Yep. Colin Purbrook. Purbrook. Well done. Oh, there he is. <laughs> what, was, what was Colin's other instrument? The bass. Right. Yeah, Alan just got that. Which pianist and comedian did Purbrook accompany on bass? Ken Dodd. Alex? Ken Dodd. No. Bruce Forsyth. No. Alan, what did you say? I didn't. I thought it was Dr. Crock and the Crackpots. I know he appeared with them once. Is it, was it Bob Monkhouse? No, it was a slightly short pianist. Dudley Moore. Yeah. Dudley's fifth jazz album, recorded in 1969, had Chris Caron on drums and who on bass? Pete, Pete Morgan. Morgan. Pete Morgan. Pete no. Oh, Pete no. McCurk, no. No. Pete, Pete McCurk had um, sadly topped himself by that. Lee. No. Mm. Better known perhaps for his ventures into fusion. Uh, uh, Rick Laird. No. Founder member of Nucleus. Oh, Jeff Clark. Roy Babington. 
It was Jeff Klein. Yeah, um, Roy came in the second wave of Nucleus. Um, Jeff was 23 when he made his first album. Who was it with? Tubby Hayes. Yeah. He, um, ten years later, Hayes recorded a more commercial album with his orchestra, assisted by arrangements by Les Condon and which pianist? Harry South. South. Yeah, Pete. Harry South. Um, in 1981, South collaborated with Annie Ross, Georgie Fame, and Hoagie Carmichael on what was going to be Hoagie's, what well, was actually Hoagie's last recording. What was it called? Two Marvelous Words. Rock no. in Chair. Think of his proper name. Hoagland. Yeah, that's the yeah. answer. Well done. And um, <clears throat> pretend we didn't hear, Alan. Um, during the 1930s depression, Carmichael survived financially after Louis recorded which of his songs? Rocking chair. Oh, Rocking chair. chair. <laughs> I think that was very astute of you. I don't know how you noticed that. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, that is the end of this contest. Uh, so oh, we have some interesting scores here. Um, John, you've, you've topped the league of the special guests in your solo oh. round. All right. I'm, I'm really? sorry to say that you haven't quite managed to come third in the um, in this quiz. So you are in fact in fourth place. Alex has a very distinguished third, and we have a tie oh. for first place with oh. Alan Pete with 21 points each. Splendid. Right. Uh, yeah. oh, are we, we going to have a sudden death Benny Carter playoff? Yeah. Well, we could have a sudden death Benny Carter playoff if you like. Um, I just have to think of a question. Oh, yeah, OK. Who what can say the... Benny Carter first? No. <laughs> Who was the trombonist playing alongside Benny Carter and Fat Swaller in Moppin' and Boppin' and Ain't Misbehaving? Oh, what's his name? Um, Dick Dickinson. Nope. Trummy Young. This, this is a really difficult one. Not, not um, Benny Morton. No. Nope. No. We'll just have to go through him until some of the... Also Benny Carter. Right. I, don't, I don't think you can get there. It's somebody called, somebody called Alton Slim Moore. Oh, I was, wow. was going to say that. that. Yes. <laughs> but but you probably will get... It was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> but you probably will get who the drummer was on those sessions and who has, in the film version of Ain't Misbehaving, which they recorded for Stormy Weather, has the drum solo with that band. Cozy Cole. No. No. Big Sid. Oh, Zoot, um, Zooty. Yeah, Zooty oh, Singleton. Man. Alan, you are this week's winner. Ah, it's yeah. a classic Zooty yeah, solo in the middle where he just bongs everything in sight. And uh, <laughs> you would have had a bonus point if you'd said JC Heard, because he's the other drummer in the film with Cab Calloway. But it's it, Cozy had not joined the Calloway Orchestra at that point, so it was JC. Ah. Man with a very neat parting. Mm. So, right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank all of you who watched this and who subscribed to it. We have raised over a thousand pounds for Macmillan Cancer Relief, and that's all down to all of you who subscribed. So thank you for that. Thank you for watching, and thanks especially to our really special guest today, John Etheridge. Thanks, John. Oh, thank you. And thanks to the old lags. Thanks to Pete, to Alex, and to Alan. And for me, the other Alan. Thank you very much, and see you again. See you again. That was Jazz Lockdown, a programme devised by Clark Tracy, presented by Alan Shipton, and featuring special guests John Etheridge, with regular panellists Pete Long, Alex Garnett, and Alan Barnes. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us, and don't forget to like and subscribe.